Right, hello uh, everyone. Hopefully technology is working for us today. Um, um, I'd like to welcome you to today's talk by the artist uh, Sylvia Rossi. My name is Trevor Horsford and I'm uh, Head of Engagement with the Association for Art History and we're the UK Subjects Association for Art History and Visual Culture. Um, our organisation is involved in advocacy, networks, memberships, grants, publications, education, and events like today's talk where we celebrate and promote the value of art history and visual culture. Uh, as part of this intro, I'd just like to thank the Italian Cultural Institute in London for sponsoring today's event and of course Sylvia for agreeing to share her work and insights with us. Um, I'm going to uh, hand over to Sylvia shortly. Um, uh, in this session today, Sylvia is going to offer us some insights into her practice, which explores her personal family history, drawing on her Togolese heritage and ideas of origins. Um, uh, as an artist, she works for self-portraiture, video and text, and we're going to see examples of some of those works. And um, I, as I say, shortly, we'll hand over uh, for, for Sylvia to tell us more about that work and about how how today's session is going to roll out. Um, we're recording today's talk. There's also a live transcription in Zoom. This can sometimes throw up some strange words as it's not perfect in terms of a translation software. And in terms of other housekeeping, um, we are going to have some time at the end of today's sessions for questions and answers, around about 10, 15 minutes after Sylvia's talk. If you do have any questions, can you use the uh, Q&A box, which hopefully you will be able to see at the bottom of your screen. Um, I think that's about it. As always happens with these things, there's occasionally uh, issues with connectivity, so please bear with us. We seem to be okay, I think, in terms of technology. So with, uh, with all of those housekeeping bits done, I think I'm okay to hand over to Sylvia. So um, see you all in around about three quarters of an hour. Great, thanks, bye. Hello everyone, thanks for joining in today. I'm just gonna share my presentation quickly. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Sylvia, I'm an artist and yeah, I usually work with photography, uh, text and video in combination. Um, I'm just going to run you through a few of my works, um, a body of work called Encounter, um, which is um, my latest uh, body of work, as well as some of um, the most recent commissions that I've been working on. Um, so I guess we're going to start with Encounter. Um, so in January, um, a few years ago, I was commissioned a body of work through the Joe Wood and Photo Works Awards. And I applied with a proposal on working um, on a project about market trade in, uh, in West Africa. Uh, I spent some time before, before the award in Asigame Market, which is in Lome, where my family's from. And I spent some time looking and photographing women uh, head carriers. And I wanted to work on a project that highlighted their works um, and showed their contribution to the economy uh, of the capital, but I wasn't quite sure how I was going to uh, approach uh, the project. So I took my first trip to Togo and I spent some time in the market, but I find it quite difficult to, to photograph there uh, because of many reasons. I, I didn't speak the language. My presence was uh, because of that a bit suspicious in the market. So many market traders didn't want to be photographed by me. But uh, it was difficult also because the, of the tradition of West African portraiture that is so grounded in the imaginary of people. So um, the act of taking a photograph was something that um, people saw more as a ceremony, as a very important moment of representation where the subject works with the photographer and negotiate the, the representations of themselves uh, through, through the camera and the objects and the clothes brought into the studio. Um, also, there was an issue with uh, market traders uh, concerning consent 
and um, me being a photographer that grew up in Europe making work in uh, in West Africa so um, while I was making the work I wanted to make sure they they did understand where the pictures were going to to be displayed after the project was finished and that wasn't always uh, easy to explain because of the language barrier so I I sort of put on a, on a side this idea of working directly with people that I met in the market. And that's when I decided to find new strategies to um, really carry on with, my, with this work that I really wanted to make. So um, I changed direction. I went back to, to Italy where my family lives. And I found some images from the family album, um, one in particular, which is this one, which portrays my, my mother when she was really young and selling in the market of Asigalme. Um, so this image was, um, was not only showing me my mom before I met her, but also she was showing me uh, the job that she, she was doing and that she did. To, to save money to make the journey to, to Italy. So that image for me drew a connection between myself and the market, which was uh, some sort of very personal and deep connection that goes beyond um, you know, the, the tradition, but also is visible in, in the tradition of head caring, which is, uh, which is uh, an element that leads all of my project uh, and something that I observed women doing and it's something that my mother and grandmother never taught me because of migration and because I um, I grew up in Italy but it's something that I try to regain through um, through this medium and through um, this sort of performative element in in my videos so um, I'll carry on showing you some images. This is um, this on the right is the first image that I shot uh, from the series. And um, to carry on a conversation about her caring, the first thing I did was to ask my mother as uh, she held the, the testimony of her experience in, uh, in Togo. So the first question that I asked her was, uh, what was your first experience of that caring? And she told me when she was really young, she would uh, work in the market sometimes to help her mother that uh, was a single mother. So she would wake up early in the morning and wear, um, wear her clothes and um, her mom would prepare a tray of uh, those two sticks that you see at the top of the image, um, which are sticks made of um, made from a tree called aloe. Um, so people chew through the sticks until they become soft, and then they use them as toothbrushes. So that's what my mom used to sell when she was really young. She would walk around the neighborhood with her tray of um, of sticks in, on her head, uh, she would shout out loud the name of the project she was selling, which was Alo. So she would just shout that in the neighborhood and people would stop her if they wanted to buy. Um, so she would sell for about an hour and then go back home, um, bathe, uh, wear her school uniform and go to school. So this is how I represented uh, this scene that my mom narrator so I sourced the school uniform from the market of Asigame uh, and the school uniforms are still what students wear today they maintain the same style I, I use some props as uh, the books and then the alo sticks which I sourced as well from the market and I take this uh, self-portrait in which I I act as I was my mom, but imagine, um, imagine an image that doesn't really exist as I, th there are no images of my, of my mother working as a young girl um, in the family album. So that's something that I constructed. And if you see um, on your left, 
this is the way I installed the work. You have a small text frame which tells exactly, well, the stories, the story that I told you, but in a shorter sentence, and the story is repeated inside the uh, the text frame, and there's a word, a word alighted in white, which is a, a tooth stick. And so that word refers directly to an object that is present, which is present in the image, but then the text in repetition creates this pattern so the viewer can um, engage with the text on different levels. It can completely ignore it and just look at the image, or it can move closer and just read the word in white. Um, and yeah, draw to that connection with the image or it can move closer and read the text and learn about the stories behind the image so um, the way I I install my work is really much thinking about the way stories are shared not only with um, a viewer in the gallery but also our stories are shared in villages like um, the one my mother grew up in where um, you often have a figure in the village called uh, Du Criot, um, who um, is, the, um, is, is the person that uh, remembers all of the stories of the village and uh, doing village gatherings, he just repeats them multiple times and often in the same way. So they become part of uh, the narrative of, of the village and uh, you sort of construct your memory on, uh, on this repetitive way of telling story and that's how um, things um, remain um, relevant and stories remain relevant. And yeah, next to this image, um, I often play this video, which is uh, um, a video of me in the same studio setting, uh, wrapping and performing the wrapping of the fabric ring, which is usually placed between the head and the load when head carrying. Um, so this is one of the examples of how I um, try to create connections between, uh, um, yeah, the practice of head carrying and uh, my family history. Uh, you have some example of uh, studio uh, portraiture. Uh, you have an image of my grandmother standing in front of the, um, of the photographer's studio posing for um, some sort of like celebration and next to it, images of my relatives working in the market. And I use those images as a reference to build my portraits. Um, so I, I reference reference them directly um, in this way. Uh, this is a video which is also part of the series in which I recorded my mother and my grandmother wrapping this fabric ring and I see um, this moment has, um, well, a very performative moment but also um, a moment where two women from different generations are showing me how to do something that I should have probably known from a really young age, but that I'm only learning recently and uh, sharing this, you know, tradition of uh, head carrying, which is uh, still surviving in modern times. And yeah, this, this video I also I also find it interesting because my grandmother, um, she is she was blind at the time the the video uh, was shot. So it's nice to see how her muscle memory remembers those mov movements that she's been performing uh, um, since a, re a really young age. So um, yeah. And then also part of the series, you have two self-portraits. Uh, one is titled, the one on the right is titled self-portrait as my father and one on the left self-portrait as my mother. And in the portraits, I dress and perform as my parents and I try to um, bring to surface stories that I heard from, from my mother. 
um, about my parents' experience um, in Italy uh, when, when they moved there. Um, and um, well, my dad was the first person to, um, to move to Italy. It was, um, it was a young man from a Togolese family. Um, he, he had this ambition of carrying on his studies in, in Italy. Um, but then when he moved there, he was soon faced with the reality of being um, um, a migrant over there. Um, so he ended up working as a tomato picker in, uh, in the south of Italy. So that's the way I represent the story uh, told by my mother. Um, I use the tomatoes as props and the tomatoes are displayed exactly in the same way as you would see them in markets in West Africa. Uh, so in, in this um, sort of like sculptural way, so people would just go there and, uh, and grab three and, um, and spike them. So I thought that's, that was something from the market that I could bring into the studio, but that was also uh, effective in telling um, the story of my dad and unregulated and exploitative jobs uh, um, in, in Italy. And while well, my dad is wearing um, a suit, um, my mom used to, used to tell me that regardless, regardless of his condition as a migrant, he would always dress up smartly and carry around books. Um, and also that's why he placed the books on his head to, to maintain this continuity in the narration of head carrying and how um, really this practice becomes a, a symbol of, uh, of hard work and uh, but also um, power as well in a sense. Um, for the text I use the same uh, techniques as in the previous image I showed you um, and on the other hand you have an image of my mother. She arrived in Italy a year after my dad she found a job quite easily as a woman in in a house. She was, um, yeah, looking after the kids of this family and like cleaning. And one day while she was working, she overheard on the radio that they were going to pass a law that would legalize um, every migrant in with, without documents in Italy. Um, and this law is called Legge Martelli. And that's how she managed to get you know, her papers and continue her journey in Italy. Um, so throughout my work and with those self-portraits, I try to represent moments that come from family narratives and also to represent moments that don't really exist in the family album reflecting on how often in, in family images we show the best moments of uh, our family life, uh, leaving out um, moments that are quite significant to our life but are not as happy. So in this way, I try to bring to surface uh, those histories and also to learn them myself as this work was for me an opportunity to um, engage in those conversations and have a confrontation with my with my mother um, about her life, which uh, consequently affected um, yeah my my identity as um, a European living um, and growing up in Italy. Um, yeah, you have a closer look um, to to the images here. Um, all of the images are self portraits and. Um, yeah, shot in the studio in London mainly. And you can see, um, I guess, this um, resemblance with images uh, from uh, artists like Malik Sibe, Saidu Keita, but um, although I really, I really love those works and I guess my main influence is uh, my family album, which, uh, which belongs to that. Um, time and significant period in time. I, 
in this project, I also worked briefly with uh, installations, trying to incorporate video um, with photography. And this is still related to ad caring. And it's, uh, it's a scene that I decided to perform. I was uh, um, walking in, in the streets of Lomé. I was uh, trying to reach my grandmother's house. And this woman was walking in front of me carrying this bag around her shoulder this bag around her shoulder and you know all of a sudden she she got tired of holding the bag so she um, took it off her arm and she just placed it um, on top of her head and then she carried on walking and I found the scene quite significant in a in a way it shows how head caring is used on a, on a daily basis for very common purposes in a way. And about this installation, I, I, just, um, I just really like how uh, photography and video work together in narrating a story. You can look at the still images and still get a sense of what is happening in the scene, but then as, as, as soon as the, the video starts playing, then um, it becomes an anticipation of, you know, the images become an anticipation of what is going to happen in the video and it sort of completes the scene. Um, so yeah, that was my <laughs> reflection on that particular moment that I experienced and uh, brought back to life through photography and video. The same happened with this scene where I was uh, in the garden and I saw this woman carrying this basket full of clothes and all of a sudden I just heard her phone ringing so she just uh, placed a tray on her head and she reached her pocket to get the phone and she just took the call and she was just walking around and gesticulating and talking and it was almost as if the, the tray um, had become, um, um, yeah, um, an extension of, of her home body as uh, she moved around that garden. And I thought that was uh, another very significant moment of, um, of the use of head carrying throughout um, daily, um, the everyday really. Um, this is an example of, um, well, a commission that I did. It was a shoot for The New Yorker uh, for a collection of designer Grace Rose Bonner. Um, it was a nice collaboration house. Uh, we shared many points in our research and we, we managed throughout the use of the studio uh, background and in objects and props that we brought in that both belong to me or to Grace's. Um, we, we managed to build images that, um, yeah, really evoke those moments of times that um, are the images of my family album, but um, also have but something new to them and um, some colors and yeah so those are some of the examples from uh, the commission where yeah I used the, the set that I usually uh, build has um, a familiar space and for example um, for the props we use this uh, chair uh, that is um, is called the Bowley chair is um, is a chair that is um, related to, um, yeah, is related to uh, a legend from Ivory Coast of this tribe moving from uh, um, that previous location, um, like nowadays Ghana, that had, they had to move to a different location because they were chased by another tribe that wanted to, um, you know, uh, take that territory. Um, so that as they as they were escaping with the other tribe uh, chasing them from afar, they they reached this river, uh, the river Komoe, and um, as soon as they reached the river, they realized they there was no way they could 
they could pass it um, as the waters were, were too strong. So um, the queen of the tribe uh, that was uh, traveling uh, with them um, figured they had to sacrifice their most valuable possessions and throw them in the river. So everyone from the tribe started to, um, you know, get rid of their most valuable possessions and throw them in the river uh, until it got to, um, to the queen. When the queen realized her most valuable possession was her son, so she threw her son in the river. And as soon as she did, hippos rose from the river to allow the tribe to, to escape to freedom on the other side of the river, leaving their enemies um, afar. And, yeah, this is um, this is why the the tribe is called Baoli because as soon as the 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 queen reached the other side and realized the son was was not coming back, then she all she kept saying was Baoli Baoli, which means uh, the son is dead, and that became the name of that tribe. So um, yeah, I, I guess that's that's a story just to give you an insight of. Mm, our thinking process when picking the props and incorporate them in uh, in an environment. Um, and this is um, another recent commission that I worked on for uh, Autograph. is um, is a body of work that I um, that I developed during um, lockdown. Mm, so when I when I got the the commission, the aim, uh, well, the yeah, the main idea behind the commission was to work on um, on this idea on uh, on portraying uh, what was happening around us um, during COVID time, and I I guess I spent some time thinking about what I was going to produce for this commission and after working on um, on my market project that then became family uh, project I I was I was in lockdown and I kept following news from from the market and from West Africa to see uh, what was happening. And I remember watching a documentary um, by a, a journalist from Sierra Leone, and it was narrating a story um, of this woman that fell ill um, in Freetown. She was living in Freetown at the time. Um, she called her family and her family told her to, to come back home. Um, so she she took a she took a taxi. Uh, she she went home. She tried to to get home on the taxi, and as soon as the taxi driver realized she was ill, he stopped the car and she dragged her out of the taxi and she left her there, and uh, and uh, and she died uh, shortly after. So what I was interesting in when the journalist was telling the stories, how he was describing the nature of relationships and community in, um, in Sierra Leone and how normally people would have gathered around her to, to help her, but instead they decided to leave her there because of fear of uh, this virus. So I started, yeah, very much thinking about this idea of, um, community and and collective spaces and uh, and being in the space of isolation that we all lived in our um, personal way and in our personal spaces as well and I, I did spend some time in uh, alone in my flat in London and you know after after I left the flat, I, I started looking back at this experience of isolation and where I was living in a constrained space, trying to reach out to the outside world. Um, so I started thinking about the space where I was living and the habits that I started to, to take of 
of, uh, you know, um, looking outside of the window to get grasp of uh, um, normal life uh, to see what people are doing, maybe a bus going, going past or um, someone walking their dog. But I was also um, analyzing how I developed certain rituals, uh, um, for example, around going to uh, the supermarket where it would take me ages to actually get out of the house. I would, I would leave and then come back with an excuse, you know, like charging my phone or getting, changing my socks, something like that. So even going to the shop became a, a ritual. So I, I decided to um, change my rat narrative at the, around that time by making an artwork about that. So I, I built this, um, um, this set, this uh, cube that is meant to symbolize my, the fact where I spent my lockdown and I started uh, performing different actions and building different images inside it using, um, yeah, the, the main door, uh, which is central in the image, and then the two windows, um, which are, yeah, which were cut out. And the idea was to reflect on uh, the body in the inside and the body on the outside. And, using different objects that uh, were available um, in the house where I was living. And yeah, this is the, the result from that commission and it's not um, a very finished and uh, finished work, but it's something that I've been uh, um, developing throughout these times. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for that presentation. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in and I'll come to those in a moment, but I just wanted to remind people again, if uh, if they did have any questions for you, they can just pop them in the, the Q&A box and then we can uh, come to those. Uh, uh, but if it's okay with you, uh, Sylvia, one of the questions that we've got here is, um, can I can I ask Sylvia what camera she uses for her studio photographs, and that it would also be interesting to know how her how your use of color versus black and white photography layers any additional meaning. So there's two yeah. there's two bits there: the technology and kind of what it means. Yeah, so I I usually shoot on a film camera. Um, a, yeah, Aster Blood uh, six by six, um, and that is mainly yeah, just because yeah, that's yeah, that's what I use. And um, black and white and color, I I guess the use of black and white and color follows the narrative of the project. Uh, for me, I shoot black and white mainly um, when the images that I shoot are quite resolved. If, if they're memory from the past that don't really have, uh, don't really affect the future. Like for example, uh, my mom's stories um, of um, being a child and selling around the streets of her neighborhood, that for me, is just a memory that, that, that I perform and I make it and uh, I make sense of that story it's in the past and I'm revisiting it. But then when it comes to color images, those images are still in, in the process in a way. Like my, my mom is still, for example, my mom, uh, she's still living in, in Italy and she's still a migrant. And uh, it's not a finished story as well for, for my dad. So I guess that's the only the, the, yeah, the only reason why I shot those images in, in color and the video as well, the one where I'm wrapping the, the fabric ring in that one, uh, I'm not really talking about memory, but um, I'm performing something that I learned um, in, at that time when I was shooting the video, spending time in villages in Senegal um, or in Togo. Okay. Um, um, 
There's a question I'll, I'll come to. I've got a question for you later myself, actually, about about the work. And you, you mentioned uh, Malik, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of a, a studio style of portrait. But rather than me jumping in, I'm going to I've got another question from one of our audience um, who's asking if you keep a process notebook, uh, you know, and capture ideas, reflections, memories and kind of, uh, you know, that, is that part of your process to draw, drawing um, those things together, those collections and like how you, how, if you've got a process, you know, kind of how you capture that, I guess. Sorry, I, did, I didn't quite get the first bit okay. of your question. Just that if, the, if there is um, some, some sort of process notebook or, or method okay. or, you know, how, how you kind of capture ideas, I guess, as part of, of your work. Yeah, so um, I guess I started off the encounter project by having chats on the phone with my mom with the excuse that I was I was in the UK, I was living in the UK and we're having chats on the phone. So I was asking her questions because um, I told her I'm going to work on a project about uh, the market so I would like to know more also about your experience and all of that so it started off as conversations on the phone where I was taking notes on my uh, on my notepad while we were talking and uh, more to to remember details than stories um, actually and starting from the way my mom told the stories then my my work is just to summarize the story in a short sentence and then start working from there um but i do also um take inspiration from uh, from the market and from the material that i gather there to build my sets and uh, um, i travel around markets to gather fabric uh, some of the fabric that i use for my set is sourced in let's say walton Stone market that yeah i've been um i've been there quite often um so yeah it's all it's all a mix of different influences and i and i guess uh, for example the installation the triptych with a video uh that was uh, inspired by a residency that i did in senegal um this place called red and um i was mainly inspired by living in a village in complete isolation just with another artist and just being given the time and the space to to produce new work so it's completely uninspired we, we didn't have internet at the time so i i just um i just really record what's happening in front of me and i and i make it into something that um yeah i can re reflect on or build on from okay um, another another question related to your use of colour has come through actually while we've been chatting. Um, asking, um, well, really kind of noticing the colours are really strong and vibrant. And and uh, a question, I guess, related to whether this is an important part of heritage, you know, kind of the use of colours um, and the, the colours that you're using. Yeah, I guess uh, for me it's important to include colors in the work because the stories I'm, I'm telling are already not always happy. So um, yeah, color, I, I guess that's why color is so present. But also if you think about the place that inspired my work, like the market of Asigame, as soon as you walked in, you walk in, there's so many colors and everything is so bright. So I guess the, the place that, that I visited and that inspired the work influences the, the image as well. Okay. Um, and, and talking of influences uh, as well, I mean, I did, when I, I, so I'd been looking at your work before we, we spoke today and it's kind of actually, uh, my understanding has shifted massively. I was lucky enough when we were still allowed to travel to go and see, um, Mali twist in in uh, Paris and thinking about studio yeah. that, and you talk a little bit about that about how that's influenced an aesthetic but then today it's really about the storytelling the family portrait so whilst it kind of has that structure in many ways of you know that studio portraiture is something very very odd maybe I'm misreading it but kind of performative a completely different thing so it kind of holds that space but 
is a very different kind of process type of work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it's more work of negotiation with a photographer in creating something that is fake, really. Um, so I, it's it's very. It's very democratic in a sense as well, because photography is such an, an accessible medium, uh, but it wasn't at the time when my, my mother grew up or um, yeah, when my grandma was younger. So you had to go to the photographer's studio because that was the only way to make photography accessible because you couldn't have your own private camera. And then to print, to get print of a photo, it was, mm, a bit less than a pound, so very, very affordable. Um, so I, I really like this aspect of allowing everyone to, to look at their best um, for a picture. And you could, you could go to the photographer studio and just borrow objects like, um, uh, I don't know, a watch or something to to pose with and most of the studios they sometimes they would have backdrops with um a mural of uh, an open fridge so you just mm -hmm. like you could just pose in front of an open fridge and show how much yeah. food you had in your fake fridge or um you could pose in front of a airplane that signifies oh i'm going to um i'm going to go i'm going to europe uh you know, there are many different objects that mean little things. For example, the radio that I use in my um, in my image, usually when you look at West African portraits, the radio, um, usually a teenager or someone really young would pose with the radio to, to take a picture and then send it back, back to the village and say, oh, look, I'm in the capital having so much fun um, going out every night. Um, so every every object becomes um, a little message, and that's what I that's what I like about West African photography, and that's what I try to take and incorporate in my work. Where um, you know the tomatoes, they're just tomatoes, but then they signify something, and they can mean um, someone that is from West Africa that looks at the image can recognize that composition of tomato as something that they saw in the market before, or someone from Italy um, that knows, I don't know, um, an Italian photographer might uh, think of a tomatoes in a different way, which are very symbolic of, you know, Italy, like our main dishes are made out of tomato, but then yeah. also who picks our tomatoes? Um, so, so I guess that's um, that's the main difference, but also the similarities between that style of portraiture and mine. We're both telling lies, uh, happy lies and sad lies. <laughs> <in a way. laughs> yeah. Um, you, you know, you mentioned uh, both. You know, I guess the, the the West African context, the 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 Italian context, but you you're. Are you split between Italy and London at the moment? And I, I noticed that we both went to LCC as well. Yeah. So I guess Elephant and Castle has changed quite a lot over oh yeah it's over coming recent. <laughs> yeah um, but yeah I, um the reason I mentioned I mentioned that was also just thinking about where you've got work that was great to see those projects but if you've got projects coming up in the UK you know where what I'm trying to think how to say this without um just thinking about the pandemic and I guess everything is a bit strange with lockdowns and knowing about work and stuff like that but have you got any projects coming up particularly in a UK context um, well, I, I did my commission for autograph, the, um, the, yeah, the lockdown commission, and that is going to be on show actually tomorrow. It's opening tomorrow at uh, autograph. Um, but right now at the moment, I am trying to um, take a little break to, <laughs> to think and research uh, yeah. new projects because I... I've been uh, quite busy, and that's not very beneficial for heart making. Yep. <laughs> in it's a space for ideas. So, so I'm trying to get back that um, that space of thinking, and okay. yeah. Um, I've also so um, another question that has just come back in, which is about the work that you talked about today. 
Um, and it's saying, if I can ask you um, whether the text is written around the pattern in the design or vice versa. So which I guess what the relationship is between, um, yeah, these design and the text within those installations. Um, so the, the text frame is, um, so is meant to uh, pick up from the colors of the image to give a sort of continuity. And then uh, the text is printed onto it. So it's, um, well, actually it's not, yeah. The text is printed onto an image, um, if that makes sense an image of the backdrop of the work that uh, continues from the image in the text frame, uh, if that makes sense. And, yeah. and yeah, I'm not sure I, I understand the question completely, but then the, the text is just a, um, a repetition where yeah where one word is highlighted so it creates this pattern um naturally um yeah i mean i'm i may be reading what i'm thinking about it into into the the, the person who asked the question but i guess it is that repeat and the pattern of the repeat and um, and whether you know one drives the other if the pattern came first and the text fits to the pattern or whether the text works then in that repeat make a pattern um i i think they they just work together um in yeah in like a simultaneous way um, yeah. in a sense yeah yeah um, i mean i guess it's this is one of the things it's always quite hard to get a close-up i guess via zoom and things yeah like, you know this is we're all kind yeah, of constrained enough. by the screen so it's you know technology is great in some ways but doesn't really give the richness yeah. of of your work or, or, or those installations. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at this, I mean, there, there's a couple of other things. I mean, basically, uh, lots of people in the audience just saying how touched they are by by the work and about how you've spoken about it um, and, and the whole story telling aspect, uh, I guess, that's, that's within the work. We've probably got time for one last question before we close up. So if I can just throw that out to the audience. Uh, okay. <laughs> yep. We've got what? Well, where can we see the work? Um, so I guess that's that thing. Um, now that we're allowed out a little bit more, where can we? Where where can we see you? Or uh, you mentioned the autograph um, project. I don't know where. Yes. The um, yes. That project is going to be on show from tomorrow at Autograph in uh, yeah Acne, like between Shoreditch and Acne, I guess yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, but then uh, the other by your work encounter is on show in Belfast, if anyone is in Belfast, at Belfast Exposed, as part of the touring exhibition of Jerrywood and Photo Works. And um, yeah, next, uh, not sure. <laughs> okay. But I mean, you've got, um... You do have a website. I can't, I'm not sure of the exact URL for that. And you're on Instagram as well. So people can yeah, sure, yeah. follow up and uh, yeah. Um, let me see. I, okay. Where is Autograph? So if it's in, if the, it's the Rivington place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's uh, just off Shoreditch High Street yeah. station. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It's like, kind of yeah, halfway between Old Street and Shoreditch High Street. So East End yeah. of London. And an amazing, amazing space there as well. Um, I think, can I squeeze in one last question, which is about the, 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 other, um, the other works, um, yeah. which is a question saying, does the original image from the archive feature in the final presentation of the work? And if so, how? Or is it more an inspiration? Yeah, I, I guess the, the archival images are not part, I don't usually exhibit them. And they're more a way of showing my sources of inspiration when talking about the work, because uh, um, at times it's, um, it's just interesting to see how a photographer 
um, gets inspiration, where they get inspiration from. So um, yeah, it's just to allow more visuals into the work, but I don't, I don't usually show them. Thank you. So um, if, if that's okay, I think that, that probably uh, leads us to closing out this session. So I'd like to say thank you so much, Sylvia, for, for sharing your insights and your work with us. Um, people can go and see that from uh, from tomorrow at Autograph. Um, I never encourage everyone to kind of go and check out your work on Instagram and on the on your own website as well. And look forward to um, seeing more of your work soon, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot.